I'm very excited um, to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Claudia von Vocano, who is the executive director of the Social Sciences D-Lab, a very important partner of ours on campus, um, as well as Digital Humanities at Berkeley. Um, Claudia is a close colleague and a truly inspiring woman working in data science. And I'm really excited that she's here to talk about how she and her research team are using cloud technologies in their measuring hate speech project. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Claudia, and welcome. Thank you so much, um, Amy. And maybe um, if you don't mind providing Aaron Coolidge the, oh, here he is, he's there. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad to have Aaron um, because he's joining me in this talk. Um, um, so the first thing I will do is put um, uh, the URL for the presentation in the chat. Um, and I'm not gonna be going back and forth. I let you, I'll let you peruse the presentation um, itself um, because I'm gonna be talking from some of those um, um, slides, but really I'm gonna diverge more than, than anything else. But um, Thank you so much, Amy. It's so fun to be here. I'm Claudia von Bacano. I'm the executive director of the Social Sciences D-Lab and Digital Humanities at Berkeley. And um, I'm also the principal investigator for um, a measuring hate speech uh, research project, which has many different uh, facets. And so I'm gonna go over uh, sort of an overview of some of those components. And then I'm gonna kind of hone in on some of kind of the major questions and perhaps challenges regarding cloud computing and 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 Aaron's going to help me with that as our deputy director of the D-Lab and our cyber infrastructure lead and um, a part of our team not so much on the research side but on the compute and, and support structure side. So um, first, I just want to acknowledge that our team is an incredibly um, uh, interdisciplinary group um, that we enjoy. Um, our lead author for our most recent uh, manuscript, which Aaron, if you have it handy dandy and put it in the chat, that'd be great. Um, Chris Kennedy is a biostatistician. Uh, he's currently a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, and he's just an incredible uh, partner um, of the D-Lab. Um, we've also enjoyed uh, participation from a linguist, Jeff Bacon, who now is a researcher at Google, um, Alexander Son, a political scientist, um, Aniket Kassari, uh, who comes from law, uh, uh, Renata Barreto, who's also a, a law PhD student, and we've had a lot of support from uh, Mark Wilson's Bear Group, the Berkeley Evaluation and Assessment Research Center, um, and the work has enjoyed support from BIDS um, and, and, and other entities. So we were really interested and curious about um, hate speech. Uh, we wanted to understand um, um, empirically what the phenomena of hate speech was. And we uh, had a hunch that there were serious issues that may be linking hate speech to hate crimes. And we started working with the Anti-Defamation League uh, earlier on and currently are partnering with the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, thinking about, you know, with the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, uh, looking at their hate map and really thinking about hate speech um, as a very complex uh, phenomena. And one of the first things that we wanted to do uh, and that we bring to the work is that we really believe in starting with a very uh, rigorous level of theorization um, to really think about the phenomena at hand to look at the literature, look at the state of the literature. And we felt quite strongly that um, the hate speech research uh, was and, and, and still is to a, to a great degree, um, fairly nascent um, and, and, and disparate. So there's different scholars that have done research on hate speech like Susan Banesh um, and Josh Tucker, just to name two. 
And then there's a lot of, um, of work, um, not necessarily a lot of work, but uh, various different projects also within industry, uh, within Facebook, there's a, a team there, uh, you know, within Google, there's uh, Google Jigsaw, another partner of ours that looks up toxicity, but there's not building a sense of building from each other is what we we saw and so that was a concern of ours and so we decided that we would bound the project uh, specifically within the United States and within the English language and that we would really look towards uh, the Trump administration and some points historically uh, to start the sampling um, of the data. So um, on the slide five um, in the presentation, which is linked in the chat, um, is um, the implementation diagram. And in that implementation diagram, you'll see that we drew from YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit um, APIs and collected and, um, in fact, have been collecting data on an ongoing basis with some interruptions. And um, Aaron can talk a little bit more about that process um, and some of the challenges that we've faced with that uh, process. But um, all in all, we do have one of the uh, largest data sets um, that is multi-platform that um, is actually able to look at the discourse from various different places. And, um, and so that's been a major innovation and strength of the work. And so what we do is we take these different comments and we create comment batches. Um, within those comment batches, we also attempt to identify some uh, slurs that may not be readily um, sort of uh, immediately understandable to the labeler. Um, and, um, and then we have a hypothesis model which says, okay, let's try to batch these comments into um, different levels within our hate speech scale. So one of the major differences between the work that we do and the work that others do is that rather than having a dichotomous, this is hate speech, yes, no, we actually have a scale that ranges, um, uh, originally we were thinking that counter speech was at the bottom, but positive identity is at the bottom, then counter speech, then neutral, um, and then it progresses from there from um, more violent and ending at genocidal. So then we use, um, we developed a Qualtrics instrument uh, with different items that pertain to our construct and through Mechanical Turk, um, we had labelers look at a, a, a set of comments, a, a network set of comments, in fact, because uh, various labelers were going to label the same comments, um, and, and that's part of our debiasing process. And they were asked very specific questions about the comment. And, um, and so this is another innovation because currently um, and in, in, in general, there's not um, a lot of thought into the labeling process um, when you're developing uh, machine learning models um, and the bias that is introduced into the model through the labeling process. Um, and the task may be very difficult for a labeler. Uh, for example, answering the question, is this hate speech, yes or no, is a very, very difficult task for a labeler, um, uh, especially if they're not English dominant or there's a lot of different factors. Um, but asking them, is there a mention of these specific protected groups within this comment? Um, and and uh, enumerating those groups, you know, uh, black, Latin, Latino, Latinx, um, et cetera, that's a much easier uh, task and question to answer. Um, and so it reduces um, the, the, the challenge in the process. Um, and so through that, you know, 
through that process, one of the most important things that we needed is to stage these comment, um, these 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 comments all along the pro the, the 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 process, and um, that has been one of the most challenging um, pieces that really. Uh, I think that the cloud computing component is highly relevant there. Ultimately, what we have done is then um, de-bias the labeling process by having um, a measure not only for hate speech of the comment or the corpus, but also having a measure for the labeler, uh, for, for the what we call rater severity. Um, and so that's part of, of, of the work that we have done. Um, but as you can see, um, there's in multiple stages, uh, really computationally intensive um, uh, challenges that we see and that we really need to rely on cloud services. Um, and when we don't, we also have some hiccups um, that, that uh, we've confronted. So once we had the label comments, we were able to um, um, combine this item response theory, which is the survey. Um, and I'll trust Amy will give me a, a sort of a time um, a, a time cues um, that we we were able to then uh, use the item response theory to develop the construct to develop the the instruments to label the comments and then to um, use the, that comment, the corpus to do the uh, deep learning uh, modeling. And um, we further evolved the model through a series of different optimizations um, that Chris Kennedy and others supported us with. Um, and we ended up with um, what we feel very confident um, is the most accurate hate speech model um, in existence. Uh, the only one that comes uh, or approaches our model is the jigsaw um, uh, model, which we outperform. And so uh, it's through these different uh, methodological innovations that um, I'll summarize now which is uh, number one, we had identified through theorization and empirically multiple construct levels, um, eight different construct levels for hate speech in contrast to um, other uh, related work where the constructs usually range uh, between two and three uh, levels. We also, the outcome um, measurement and granul granularity is um, is uh, exponentially greater. Um, we have 45 uh, different levels of uh, granularity um, uh, of uh, outcome of the outcome space. And um, many of this uh, historical, uh, uh, not historical, but this previous uh, uh, research relied on um, classical test theory and uh, and we rely on a faceted Rosh IRT, uh, which is um, allows for us to look at the bias of the labeler, and to um, and to in effect debias the labeling process. We also really looked at identity categories in a in a more nuanced manner. We looked at racial, uh, uh, gender. Um, immigration, nationality, a wide array of different uh, protected group categories that were really important. Um, and of course, this is sort of an unfair um, comparison, but we were able to use and continue to be using the most, you know, the most recent algorithms. Um, we have um, 50,000 observations, uh, comments that were labeled, we're multi-platform as opposed to using one platform. Um, and here's the, the piece that's really important is having the labeling or the ratings per comment be uh, four so that we can then think through those different, um, uh, look at uh, statistically measure and understand the, the variance between the, the ways, the, how strictly um, the labelers rated a given comment. Um, so with that, I think I will turn it over to Aaron to talk a little bit more about 
uh, issues related to, uh, you know, the challenges of having, you know, a dedicated uh, virtual private cloud, having uh, the, the cloud compute power that's necessary to stage this different batch um, uh, comments, uh, to be able to integrate that into Mechanical Turk, uh, to use that with Qualtrics. Um, and um, it, 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 it's been a learning process. And so um, I'll turn it over to Aaron to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and, and some of the, the successes that we've had with that. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, so for some of you who saw me at the beginning of this session, uh, I was actually in the Warren data center uh, fixing our uh, data science server that we use uh, for a lot of the heavy duty processing. And then luckily I live just close enough down by University of San Pablo to drive down this way during the last talk, listen into that and uh, be back on my porch. So um, yeah, this the work that uh, uh, Claudia and the whole hate speech team is doing is really incredible. I'm, I'm sharing this diagram that we we're showing a little bit earlier, just so you can kind of see the both the complexity of, of kind of this process that we're working with, as well as kind of the inputs. And then along the way, you know, what, what, what are we using in terms of um, like uh, compute in this? Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, obviously works on Amazon Web Services um, and with those crowd workers, uh, labeling the data, um, that, that's such an important part of, of this whole process. Um, that's disconnected from our actual uh, computing environment. Um, and you know, that, that's uh, both for simplicity and, and for uh, security's sake. Um, the server that we have is, is hosted in the, the, the data science, or the, the data, data center. Um, and uh, it has about three GPUs in it, um, a couple of really basic ones, and then one that's, I think, uh, 24, 24 gigs uh, of RAM. Um, and uh, it's the real workhorse of, of our machine learning pipeline. Um, data, there's a lot of data. And for those of you who've worked with um, high-performance computing environments, uh, one of the things you'll, you'll know about uh, data is that uh, file systems like larger files. File systems don't like teeny tiny files and lots of them, but that's what we have in, in this form. So the raw data itself uh, from the data collection um, is a lot of small JSON files. Um, from a data science perspective, that's actually really convenient to work with. I can you know, write very simple algorithms in my Jupyter Notebook and be, be able to process data uh, uh, that's in that format very easily. Um, with kind of the, the basic, you know, file system um, uh, iteration uh, that you would learn in any basic like Python class. Um, a lot of the, the programming that we do is in Python. You know, some folks might also use R for their analysis. Um, we tend to be very bilingual uh, at the D-Lab and in the work that we're doing. Uh, we don't really privilege one language or tool over another, but we do try to figure out, you know, what's the best tool for this particular job and of course, the D Lab is just an amazing resource on this campus for graduate students, but also for staff and others who want to learn how to how to use these tools. Um, and uh, you know, we we occasionally uh, do some more specialized workshops. Um, and and you know, one one I'd love to do is like, how do you work with data like this? Because it's working with APIs, it's working with uncomfortably large amounts of data, um, like. You could technically go get uh, you know, um, a drive and plug it into your laptop and probably use your laptop for this, but it's uncomfortably large. You, you'd be by buying a, a large external drive to plug into your drive to do it. And then when you wanna collaborate with people at this scale of data, you, you really can't easily collaborate with multiple people unless you have a hosted server or cloud environment to be able to do that. Um, so, what else here? I mean, there, there's so much in this pipeline that I could um, describe to you. It might help if anybody has any questions um, that I can, you know, zero in on certain parts of this diagram, if that would be of interest to folks. So if there's questions in the chat, let me see if I can pop open the chat and see it. Looks like no questions yet, but I was thinking the same thing. This is a perfect time for that. And here's one. 
And that is, what standards do you have for using Mechanical Turk ethically? Yes, that's an excellent question. And I think that's a really important question. Um, we, uh, first of all, we uh, think that the compensation was really important to think through and um, estimate and budget. So we didn't want to uh, lowball the compensation. And so I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I know that we ended up paying uh, significantly more uh, uh, per, uh, per job than would normally be the case. Um, and um, we also narrowed uh, Turkers to um, the United States. Uh, and that, of course, can be, you could game that and you could actually uh, figure out a way to, to not treat from the United States, but we felt like that also uh, was helpful. We collected information, demographic information about Turk workers um, to kind of get a better sense and understanding of their background. Um, also, you know, we went through institutional review board, of course, um, and so we went through and um, and there were several different um, levels of issues that we addressed. Um, we um, therefore, through the institutional review board, um, of course, we have disclaimers on um, you know they they knew fully well what they were going to be seeing because in this case it's even more problematic, right? That they they might be exposed to some comments that are very negative. Um, although that is less than 1%, and uh, we did oversample for hate speech, um, and the most extreme hate speech is even, you know, more rare, uh, but we gave, you know, full, you know, um, uh, disclosure of the types of information and types of comments that they would be receiving, um, and, um, and then there, they also there's a feedback loop um, in the IRB uh, research design where they can um, uh, contact IRB if they feel like there were any unethical um, issues in the way that the research was designed. Um, I could go on and on, but um, I, I think suffice it to say that I think that we went way beyond uh, what any normal um, uh, group using Mechanical Turk would do to ensure that it was um, as ethical as possible. That being said, I think that it's very reasonable to think that some people are just like, I just not will not use Mechanical Turk. Um, and I think that that's a defensible position as well. Um, but I think increasingly it's such a powerful tool for research. I think it is really important. And this is another area that we could develop a workshop in, in terms of the design elements um, for, uh, for, for the treatment of mechanical Turk workers, but that's an excellent, excellent question. And I love that uh, Bill Allison put in here into the chat that the Cloud Resource Center, which is one of our um, you know local campus community um, uh, resources for for clouds, I'll, I'll put that link in there. Um, Bill put a link in here to UMass uh, and and their sort of research guidance on mechanical Turk, and you know how how you have to work with the IRB. Um, in that context, but I think, you know, certainly what, what Claudia and the hate speech team did in this context, like, like she said, is going way above where most people are in terms of uh, using it as a resource. Uh, yeah, and one of the things addressing Bill's um, resource, we did make it clear um, in terms of how much time people had, uh, we made transparent the compensation, the, tr the compensation was uh, uh, the same across the board. Um, uh, you had the same opportunity to, um, uh, to, to take hits. Um, and so we did uh, follow most of these uh, guidelines that I'm seeing here uh, uh, for sure. But this is a great resource. Thanks so much, Bill. Looks like we have a couple more questions in chat and just a few more minutes. Um, Aaron and Claudia, do you wanna give a go at one of these? we could read it aloud does the sampling of speech on public social or who put this in there was that bill you want to just ask the question it's nice to hear people's voices in the room yeah sure um uh, let me see yeah i was just wondering if sampling a speech from social media is like more heavily toxic than other places that have different types of hate or biased speech and i wondered what other 
if you'd explored that, it seemed like it'd be hard to find digitizable sources of um, that you could use for part of a corpus that were outside of social media. Yeah, and I think that this is one of the questions that we're wondering about, right? And Josh Tucker does a nice job of um, actually um, arguing that um, there's a lot less hate speech than, than one would assume. Um, and doing sort of a systematic measurement of hate speech online is not some is not something we're currently doing, right? As a as as a field, um, because we don't have a, a tool like what the uh, DLab has developed, um, deployed on Facebook, on Twitter, on Reddit, and all these different places yet. Hopefully, we will in this in the future. We have a meeting coming up. Uh, uh, that we, we're going to reschedule with Facebook that we've kind of been pushing back a little bit. Um, so we don't empirically know how much hatefulness um, there is on any given platform. Maybe we have a little more information about toxicity uh, with the Google jigsaw, um, uh, but we do kind of characterize the different platforms um, and without necessarily being empirically driven. And I think that that's a problem. Um, and, and I'm as much an advocate of free speech and political speech online as I am of anything else. And so I am very careful to, to say, like, let's not assume that there's loads of hate speech or toxicity online. Uh, in fact, what we find is that it's a very small percentage uh, of what is, is out there, even though sometimes it feels like a lot more. Something interesting that happened is that in our partnership with the Southern Poverty Law Center and um, in our piece, uh, Sounds Like Hate, um, uh, that that um, there's a little component of our work in there, and there's this beautiful um, a podcast that I really recommend to folks um, that I'll pull up uh, and, and share with you guys, uh, is that uh, we have the opportunity to look at um, uh, right-wing extremist, uh, a corpus of right-wing extremist rhetoric, and it was internal discussions, more like WhatsApp kind of conversations that were more in-group, and so that's a little bit more of a different phenomena. It's more like a social mobilization kind of phenomena. Uh, but I think, uh, and, and then even there, it's hard to find a lot of explicit hate, hateful speech because a lot of it is actually motivating people to become part of a movement, um, even though that movement is extremely racist um, and, 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 and bigoted. Um, so yes, it's, uh, it's somewhat difficult to get um, a good corpus going, especially because the people who have the most robust um, data sets that we could use are um, um, either a nonprofit like the Anti-Defamation League and it's a proprietary data set or a corporation like Facebook. Um, and again, there's a very hard wall there that doesn't uh, enable us easily. But Twitter and Facebook recently have made some new partnerships with social scientists to conduct research. And so we're always hoping and, and uh, through the through uh, Marion Fourcad and Dave Harding, we are pushing the social science, um, the, 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 that boundary that where we're trying to get uh, more cooperation with the different platforms to get access to uh, data sets that could help advance this work. Um, but all really, really good questions. Oh, thanks so much, Aaron was able to put the sounds like hate um, information on there. And I know it's near the top of the hour. We had one more question. So I'll let Amy do our closing and we can stick around for that question. Thank you, Aaron. You read my mind, absolutely. So um, first of all, thank you so much to our speakers. And I want to mention again, I said this at the beginning, but in addition to leading the D Lab and being a renowned scholar, Claudia is also one of the WIDS 2021 planners, and she's facilitating one of the panels uh, during WIDS. So definitely look for that. And thank you to both Claudia and to Alicia for being here today and speaking. Um, thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you to the planners. And um, our next meetup is on Thursday, March 25th. And here's also a link. Uh, if you know of a speaker or even a topic that you would like to hear at a future meetup, um, please suggest that in that link. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. All right, I'll see half of you at the IST all staff meeting. <laughs> Alec, did you want to ask your question? Bye-bye.
Is Alex still here? Yes. Aaron, did you want to um, take a shot at answering Alex's question? I, I I've see got a, Alex. I've got to run. I'm assigning you, Aaron. OK, thanks. Uh, Alec, I, I see you just unmuted. Yeah, go, go ahead and ask. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of the notion of uh, around the notion of who are the actors involved here, what kind of agency there is. And along with uh, sort of a typology of targeted groups, is, is there, do you have any kind of typology of, of the us that might be in this, this very negative equation uh, that, that, that's uh, taking place in terms of speech? So, there, so if I'm understanding you correctly, um, uh, who, so that we we understand who the protected group or the targets are, um, but also, um, so I guess uh, I'm not sure what you mean by us, but we are also fine tuning uh, a set of bad actors, right? Um, um, uh, hate uh, haters, if you will. And uh, we are developing a further typology, um, specifically with right-wing extremists, which is you know one slice and one perspective on the topic. Um, and so that's the next iteration is we're going to be doing some additional labeling um, to characterize right-wing extremism within this discourse community that's hateful. Um, but um, I guess say a little bit more about who the us might be. Actually, I think that you've captured it there. Okay, great. And and again, think, thinking towards uh, what what kind of variations of us there might be, uh, and and uh, and uh, fracturing within that, uh, what might not be so, such a monolithic us from their point of view. Absolutely, it's like the plurality that exists within that group um, is something is one of the major mistakes, right? That politically, I think we've made if we're in the in the left. Um, and so uh, Marion Mar Foucault in the Solidarity and Democracy program at the Social Science Matrix, uh, which you should uh, come and join uh, those discussions and those lectures is really um, confronting those questions as well. Um, but yes, I think you're absolutely right. And, and this is um, one of our um, newest collaborators, Severin Science, is looking at the, uh, the plurality of the uh, right-wing extremism. Um, and, and the different ideologies um, uh, like nationalism and um, uh, white supremacy and, you know, and, and the different typologies within that right wing extremism. So, so yeah, that's, that's really on point, Alec, that, that we really need to think very thoroughly and in complex ways and not character and make a caricature, uh, which I think is a mistake that we've made in the past. Yeah, great. Also, thanks for all the all the links in the chat and uh, letting us just save the chat. Yeah, this has been super fun. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. And thank you for this important work and sharing it with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much for having us.